Ever since our founding fathers thought we should have the right to pursue happiness, we've been getting in our own way. If you're tired of that and ready for happiness, you've come to the right place. Barriers to growth and why aren't we happy is next on Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. For many of us, happiness is elusive despite all the positive factors in our lives. We hang on to things like perfectionism, shame, and resentment, all of which create barriers to growth. This week, our guests have personal insights and tips that just may help you find the joy that you've been looking for. As always, we encourage your questions, so call now locally, dial 218-788-2844 or call toll-free at 1-877-307-8762. And you can also email us your questions using the address listed at the bottom of your screen. Now let's meet our guests. Dr. Doug Heck is a licensed psychologist with the Duluth Psychological Clinic who treats adults with a variety of psychological problems and specializes in treating those who've had a life-changing health crisis. And Deborah Adele was the owner and director of Yoga North for 14 years and is the author of The Yamas and Niyamas, Exploring Yoga's Ethical Practice. Thanks to both of you for coming here tonight. I'm really excited um, to have both of our guests here. And um, just in case, so so true to form, when I say that she is the author of the Yamas and the Niyamas, here, here is the book. <laughs> and I wanna say right off the bat, because I'm afraid I'll forget it if I don't, that if you do not own this and you do not have this after the show, figure out how to get a hold of this book. It is excellent and it is life changing. I've had a lot of my own clients read this and it's absolutely remarkable. So we're very fortunate to have you, to have you here. And I thought a really good place to start um, would be for us to just sort of even explore for a few minutes this notion of what happiness is because I think, you know, we have a pretty good idea of when, when we're five years old of what makes us happy um, and, and the joy that we even see. You know, if you watch a five-year-old, um, a young mother I know told me about taking her almost one-year-old on a cross-country ski trip um, in, in, a, in a chariot behind her and she heard this little, not quite one-year-old going, wee! <laughs> and, you know, it's like, oh, as an adult, I want, I want to be doing we in my life. So, um, Doug, when, when we talk about happiness for adults, what is it, how is it that you conceptualize that? Well, the very first thing I think of is, is what I learned a while back from somebody who was um, teaching me about some happiness. And he said, who, who are the happiest people on the earth? And this person said, they're toddlers look at them. They're focused on the moment. They're focused on just the, the joy that they're having at the time. And so when I look then at adults and try to, try to figure out then what do we know from those toddlers that we can maybe help with adults, some of the same principles apply. And as we really try to help people become happier, we try to help them become more focused in the moment. We help them try to take a look at what's inside them, enjoying what they're doing at the time, and a lot of other things like that. Um, defining happiness is difficult because there's so many different pieces to it. Contentment and satisfaction and trust and a number of things. But that, but that being fully present in the moment that we mm -hmm. see in toddlers is, is, is part of that. Deborah, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to have you sort of talk about that concept of happiness. Along with what you both said, there's, I think with children, this exploration, um, they're so excited to be in a body. They're so excited to run and roll down hills yeah. and look at their fingers and look at their toes. And they're free to do that. So the question that I have is, I mean, I think that that shows us that happiness is a birthright. I mean, it's, it's the norm. And so what is it that our minds are led to believe that gets in our way of that mm -hmm. same exploration. Why can't we just go outside and play for hours and just explore and forget to eat because we're in so much joy? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of that happens for us because we get so many self-imposed ideas on us about what we need to be happy or who we should be or what we should look like. And so um, we start building a lot of these barriers that suffocate our own happiness. Let's talk about this concept of, of self-acceptance and, and where, where that fits in. And I, I want to bring that to the table because um, in preparing for the show, um, Dr. Robert Holden, a, 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 a psychologist out of, out of Britain who, who founded the Happiness Project, has um, had this saying that no amount of self-improvement can make up for any lack of self-acceptance. Um, and that, that sort of like, that was like a smack in the face. Um, just that, that concept of why replace the windows in your house if the foundation is crumbling, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And let's talk about, um, Deborah, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that role of self-acceptance um, in its relation to happiness then. Well, there was a uh, Kripalu Institute out, um, out east. is a big yoga center. And they decided with their faculty that they were going to bring in some, um, someone from the East to teach the faculty some advanced practices. And, and after, so this, this gentleman came over. He was a great teacher from India. And he started working with the faculty and teaching these great wisdom teachings, giving practices. And lo and behold, after a couple of weeks, he met with the staff and he just said, this is not going to work. He said, you none of you love yourself. Hmm. So it doesn't even matter if I give you any teachings or if you do any practices, you can't take it in until you learn to love yourself first. Mm -hmm. And that has really, um, that's really impacted my thinking in terms of this criticalness of, um, of falling in love with ourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we, our job, Doug, is to be in the position of trying to help people when when they come to us and help them make some changes. And so when I talk with some people about the notion of self-acceptance, um, they say, well, how can I accept myself if, if what I need to do is change? And, and you must have experienced some of that too, that, mm -hmm. that sort of that hand-in-hand that, that hand -hand dichotomy of mm -hmm. how, that, how change, you know, I can want to change and mm -hmm. accept myself for where I am right now. Mm -hmm. Well, what comes to mind for me there is is the crucial understanding that change is not necessarily something to judge negatively. And change is often a, a, an indicator, or the capacity to change is often an indicator of a healthy, well, uh, stable person who can change and adapt to his or her situation. And I think what, what comes into play there often is, uh, what, I what I talk to people a lot about is just the uh, rampant amount of judgmentalism that occurs toward ourselves and toward others. And um, the judgmentalism can come into play, just like what you said, when somebody's coming in to see a psychologist, they may already be judging themselves negatively because they're simply coming in to try to become happier, become better or they may have led a life of judging themselves negative in some ways, which leads them to compare themselves to others to try to figure out if they're okay or not. So I, I really like to talk to people a lot about noticing how often do you judge? And I just ask people during the day to keep track. How often do you judge someone else? How often do you judge the, the environment that you're in, the work that you're doing, these kind of things. And a lot of times, simply by noticing that, people are able to see the impact that it has on them, which then in turn can help them be more okay with themselves and what they're doing. And one of the things that you mentioned in, in talking about this is this notion of comparing ourselves to others. And mm -hmm. you talk a lot about this in the book, The Yamas and the, and the Niyamas. And so I'd like, it, because that, that, that whole, judging oneself, judging other people, and comparing ourselves to others are big barriers to happiness. Very then. They're deathly, really. Yeah, and they, all they do is make us look outside ourselves, and they keep us really from loving this mortal part of us. And I think we're, we would all agree that we're both mortal and immortal. And so how do we just love this mortal part of us, love the flesh, love, love eating strawberries, love the ability mm -hmm. to take walks in the park, and not weaken ourselves 
by fighting with ourselves, um, comparing ourselves, expecting so much from ourselves, mm -hmm. but just loving our limitations. Um, and then I think further it's this pursuit of, of becoming more and more a fuller us. So to continue to grow in our full potential, that's where the excitement comes and I think that's where we can jump shift from a lot of the blaming and judging and self-criticism that we do to ourselves, is get so excited about our life. Absolutely, mm -hmm. I think so many people, and perhaps this is a, a result of our society or maybe it's a human condition, but so many people are f focused on deficits mm -hmm. and absences mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of things that they mm -hmm. think they should have mm -hmm. or impairments in some way or, or judgments, negative judgments that they've taken in on themselves. And really, I think what's happening over time is that those of us who are trying to help people become better people are really shifting our focus as well on bringing out the strengths that people have and reducing the judgments that they're having of, of themselves and really drawing on their own resources. Yes. And I think in your book, you, you refer to this as a value or of uh, non-stealing, yes. I believe. Yes. And so it's about really helping people turn around from looking for answers out here and helping them turn inward mm -hmm. to try to look for their, some of their uh, improvement or, or, or results that they're looking for to become happier. And, and, and I, I just, I, th when I read the book for the first time, that, that word non-stealing was such a foreign word for yeah. me, but that concept, but I love that concept that if I'm comparing myself to somebody else, it's like I'm trying to steal parts of them mm -hmm to make up for what I right. feel I lack right. in myself. Right. And I can't remember if it was um, <clears throat> Helen Keller or Eleanor Roosevelt who said, be yourself, everyone else is taken, yes. uh, right? That's but it, it is yeah. that, because yeah. um, I think both Helen Keller and Eleanor Roosevelt probably got it. Who, whichever one of yeah. you said it, yeah. um, bo both of you got the concept of non-stealing without necessarily mm -hmm. calling it Mm -hmm. non-stealing non mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. um, hanging on to resentments, whether it's in the form of grudge, whether it's in the form of anger I can't let go of, talk a little bit about how that creates a barrier to happiness and then you know, I think I think we want to start there and then we want to move to like how do we do that letting go because mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of people who they want to let go but don't know how, how mm -hmm. to do that. But just talk first maybe, Doug, about just what that holding on to resentments does mm -hmm. in terms of creating that barrier to happiness and growth. I, I guess one of the barriers there is that it, at the root of it typically is some kind of injury, some kind of hurt that the person has felt. And it could be any, any type of hurt. And uh, it usually isn't for somebody that, first off, feeling resentful isn't necessarily an indicator of being faulty in some way. It's a human feeling. Mm -hmm. Holding on to it, though, even for a few days or a few weeks isn't necessarily odd or abnormal. But as one holds on to it longer and longer, then the detriment of it builds and builds. And we know that resentment that is held inside for years and years is, is highly correlated with heart disease. And so it ultimately can become a killer if we hold on to too much anger, resentment, these kind of things. So I think what, what comes down to helping people with this is first understanding, help them understand what the hurt is, artic articulating it, having them express that, and then being able to learn some skills that might Im involve some forgiving or, or understanding the person that they feel like who hurt them. That's often a big skill to mm -hmm. learn is because people who've been hurt often attribute certain reasons why this person did this to them. Mm -hmm. And understanding the person who hurt them to a better degree sometimes can allow people to let go of why they feel like they were hurt. So there's some very specific things that can be helpful there. Not always easy. You remind me of a quote, what's one of my favorite from Joel Kramer, and he says, the scene is the movement. So just the ability to see something and admit it to ourselves or see it clearly is, in fact, starts the change. Right. That we don't have to fix it or analyze it to death. That that begins to move. But I also think there's this whole thing about are we replacing some of these negative things we do with something more exciting. Mm -hmm. So yoga talks a lot, I mean, in my language, of a replacement program. 
like stay non-attached, see this stuff, but stay non-attached to it, and then practice something different. And I'm reminded of uh, Houston Smith's, that great uh, world religion scholar, and he had that paraphrased that um, there is something inside of each one of us that is so, um, it's so full, it's content, it's always happy, it's always satisfied, it's wise, it's clear. And he said, but it's deep inside us, and that's the problem. And for me, I get so curious to find that fullness of myself that resides in here. And that starts to take um, more interest for me than my own um, tendency to beat up on myself mm -hmm. or those silly things that mm -hmm. waste my energy. Mm -hmm. And so then, part of what I heard you say, Deborah, was that the first step in letting go is um, telling the truth that you're hanging on. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, um, yes. Which also gets uh, what you write in the book about truthfulness mm -hmm. and, and being truthful to mm -hmm. ourselves and mm -hmm. acknowledging, um, uh, you know, our shortcomings, not in that critical way, but in that in that honest, we're, yes. we're, we're not, we're not yes. perfect being. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're not perfect being way. There's, there's, um, there's a saying in the, in, that's kind of out there in, 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 the, in the lay culture uh, about hanging on to anger and resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to yes. die, yes. right? And that's yes. another way of, mm -hmm. of sh I think, just showing us mm -hmm. of a anger hurts and holding on to that hurts us. Mm -hmm. it, it, it does nothing to whoever you have these resentments, mm -hmm. these resentments to. You mm -hmm. were gonna say, you were gonna add something. Oh, I was just going to, as you were talking, I was just thinking it, it really comes back in my mind again about just helping people understand it as we're talking about and observing it and noticing it about themselves and seeing it as somewhat a, as a, as a dilemma that many, many people go through without judging it mm -hmm. and without judging themselves. It's just mm -hmm. such a, I think, a critical piece to helping people become happier is, is about accepting even the difficulties that we have or the things we're not doing well without judging them. This yeah. is this gets related to me then to um, that concept of perfectionism mm -hmm. um, and how um, there are a lot of people out there who will be able to say, well I know it's not possible to be perfect, yes. um, but if there's a way, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're going to be first in line. Absolutely. And so how can we move ourselves? Uh, I think, first of all, how are we drawn to this, this unachievable goal? Um, and how can we um, get it off of our to-do list? I think there's a way that we have an image of ourselves that walks way out in front of the real us. It walks out to greet the public while the rest of us stays back here. And I had a really uh, humbling experience with that. After the book came out, I had, I had some interviews. And, and the first one I had was a, a lengthy one. It was 45 minutes. And she asked me about my life and all kinds of things and asked me what I read at night, what was on my nightstand. And I said, oh, the mystics. I like to feed my soul. Well, it was a lie. <laughs> it was a lie. I play Sudoku. At night, <laughs> and so, and I, I so, didn't. So what's on your night <laughs> nightstand? Yeah, exactly. And so I didn't even know that I had lied until I heard the interview played back, and that was appalling to me. I had to think about that for a long time, and I realized I had gotten caught up in this image of perfection of who I should be now that I was an author, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that was going out there to answer the questions, and it was a very boring interview because this, this perfect image perceived that I was answering to, really, it, that wasn't interesting. And go ahead, please. Can, can I please make a comment yeah, here? Yeah. This, so what you just modeled is really what we're trying to help people get to. You're, you're on TV right now. Oh. <laughs> and, and you just said, so. I lied. Mm -hmm. and, and to have the courage to do that, mm -hmm. Im implies that you're going to be okay by letting yeah. people out here know that you lied during an important moment yeah. of your life. It freed me. It freed me and to start to be myself. And, and mm -hmm. look how comfortable you are mm -hmm. with this. This mm -hmm. is what we're talking about, right. is being able to, to mm -hmm. understand these things about ourselves without the judgment, without right. that harsh, uh, what I call the self-critic, right. can be so harsh. Yeah. You just, you just, that's just such a wonderful yeah. example. Learning to love 
Our imperfections, yeah. I mean, really learning to love our earthiness, our, yeah. mm -hmm. our limits. And, and I, I do think, um, kind of related to what you're saying, too, is that um, Adele, you, uh, Adele, um, Deborah, <laughs> you, 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 um, you told the story with this smile on your face mm -hmm. and the sense of humor about, mm -hmm. about that. And, and I think that if we can uh, you know, rather than be embarrassed by ourselves, if we can tell this, get out in front and tell the story on ourselves first. Yes. Um, you know, I use humor as a, a way of interacting with people, but it's also a way of fighting back my own judgment against mm -hmm. myself. Right? Mm -hmm. Of if I if I can laugh at myself, I'm more willing to be accepting and take a look at this mm -hmm. than. Um, if I'm unmerciful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I work uh, with a lot of people with various kinds of health difficulties and some disabilities and one of them is, is sometimes there are people that have memory difficulties and the people that tend to hide their memory difficulties and try to remain active socially and engaged and trying to hide the fact that they don't remember well are so stressed out by that mm -hmm. and, and they avoid even going out eventually because they mm -hmm. feel like they're going to be found. Mm -hmm. The people that end up becoming happier and more socially mm -hmm. adept are the people who say, hi, Carolyn, my name is Doug. Mm -hmm. Before we get started, I have to tell you, I just don't remember things so well, so I may ask you something more than once tonight, but hey, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. and, and they're just much freer. And yes. again, it's implying yes. that they've, be, they've developed an acceptance of something that they once were afraid of, mm -hmm. and now they're, they're accepting of it. So. The, we, we have a, a question here, um, Deborah. I, I think I'll shoot this one to you first, which is um, how can grief interfere with us moving on and finding happiness? And, and for me also that question isn't just about, you know, you could have the word grief, but mm -hmm. you could have this bad event in my life or any mm -hmm. kind of loss that could be a loss of a person but a, a different kind of loss. Mm -hmm. I put, I put grief in its own category in a way, because uh, I think grief uh, needs to have its way with us. We need to grieve until the grief has moved through us, and then it deposits us someplace else on a new shore. And we're, we're, if we've really done what grief has asked us to do, it will open up something else for us, but the only channel is through it. And I think that, in a way, that's really true for everything else. Um, they're great opportunities to build character, to learn, to, um, to become stronger, um, more insightful, more clear. So I sort of welcome hard things, because um, otherwise it's too easy to lose compassion or to stop growing or to be comfortable. And I, I don't think that's what we're about. Um, so I think yoga is the only place I've ever heard people say, I'm going through a hard time, and someone else says, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> which, which maybe Doug and I will borrow now that, 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 you've, given us a, that you've given us this little tip. Uh, but, but part of the, what, you, what you just talked about is that what we typically classify as negative emotions, grief, sadness, anger, um, jealousy, that if that, that the path to happiness is moving through um, and rather than trying to avoid that. Mm -hmm. it's Looking the, at it oh, as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the stories we put on the emotions that can get us in trouble. That's where we have to be careful. Um, say, mm -hmm. say something. Just let the emotion be pure, not have to explain it to ourselves or go to a, a victim place or run it back through our childhood, but just let it be a pure emotion. Mm -hmm. um, the story can stay stuck in us forever. Uh, I've heard some of the brain research that an emotion moves through at about two and a half minutes and is gone. So grief obviously lasts a lot longer. Mm -hmm. But some of these things that we attach a story to our anger and then it builds this bitterness in us and lasts in our body. And, and so the distinguishing that I think is very important. Respecting the emotions and really asking ourselves if the story is helpful and usually it's not. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's almost like when, when once we attach the story mm -hmm. to the emotion, on its way out we've pulled it back in. Yes, yes. And anchor, keep... anchored it inside yeah. us and tied it there yeah. 
saying like, yeah. you need to come back and yeah. sit next to me. We sort of fall in love with the story to our own detriment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, well, can you believe that we, we are at the end? What, what a wonderful, what a wonderful <laughs> conversation. Um, this, is a, this was a three hour show, right? Um, <laughs> because it's a three hour show because we need a lot of practice um, with, with being happy. And, and so part of what we learned tonight is what? Don't be, don't be judgmental, and, and I'm using the word don't. Be non-judgmental with ourselves. Be truthful with ourselves. Be self-accepting and loving towards ourself and towards other people. That is the path to happiness. Thanks so much for coming here. And don't forget to visit us on the web at speakyourmindonline.org where you can find a schedule of our topics and resource links and read my blog where you will find out where to buy the book um, for the caller who called in twice and asked. And you can also email us your questions about next week's show when we'll be talking about anxiety and anxiety disorders. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night. <music>